Okay, welcome to our new teaching on water baptism. Uh, this is a new teaching. I uh, have not brought this before, um, especially with the revelation that is going to be coming uh, uh, with it. Um, and the reason for this new teaching is because of this new revelation. I've, um, I've had some of this uh, for some time. And I've changed the method of water baptism because of it. Uh, and uh, where I no longer lay hands on the person as I baptize them. And, um, but uh, I have dove deeper into that teaching now. And want to bring it for everyone's sake, for the body here. And for those of you on YouTube to understand the reason why I am baptizing the way that I am now. Now water baptism isn't something new. Paul says the first water baptism was uh, the passing of the ark through the waters and the heavens falling down and baptizing them as they traveled to new land. And then the next one seen is the uh, crossing of the Red Sea. That was the baptism of Moses. And, uh, and it represented uh, going dying from the old life, walking uh, into a new land, into a new life. And then the next baptism scene is the baptism of Joshua when Israel passed through the Jordan River as it parted its ways just like the Red Sea did and they passed under its waters though on dry land and so they were baptized unto Joshua and uh, came into a new land to start a whole new life. And so there are several baptisms that are portrayed by type in the, uh, in the Old Testament. This led the Jews to begin uh, baptizing uh, on an annual basis uh, just before the Feast of Atonement. And they had many reasons for what they called ceremonial washings. There were several different types of ceremonial washings. Uh, one is by being sprinkled with the, uh, uh, clear, the pure water uh, and uh, cedar, uh, red fabric in ash form, and the ashes of the red heifer, uh, sprinkled for cleansing, um, and then um, which represented the blood of Christ and the Spirit sprinkled on us. But then there is a water baptism that is done just before the Feast of Atonement when most of Israel would come and they would be water baptized by a priest or a Levite in a pool of water and it always represented going completely under the water as you do a dead body uh, in the Greek. The Greek word is baptismo in the New Testament and it means to be fully immersed, not just sprinkled, <clears throat> fully immersed. Now, the sprinkling is important. We need to be sprinkled with the blood of Christ in type. But that, and we need to have the, the pure water with that sprinkling. But that only represents where we're at right now. Don't you know there's different stages of the depth of our Christian walk? And it's portrayed in many different ways. It's portrayed in the harvest of Israel. The barley harvest is a type of salvation, whereas the wheat harvest at Pentecost is a type of being spirit-filled. And then the fruit harvest in the fall is another type portraying the best harvest of all, which is being full of the joy in the Spirit of God. In other words, having the fullness of our inheritance. And so also in baptisms, there's the sprinkling with hyssop, of the pure water mixed with cedar, mixed with the red fabric of the, of the tabernacle, mixed with the ashes of the red heifer. That represents the earnest of our inheritance, which is God in Christ, salvation of our souls, but not the full salvation. We haven't been fully baptized yet. That is coming. We have the salvation of our souls, but we long for the redemption of our flesh. We long for the full resurrection and a perfect body that will never die, as Paul puts it, and uh, that will be perfect in every way. And, uh, and that is represented by the full baptism in the Holy Spirit. Our full salvation that will come immediately uh, upon the rapture 
and, is, and it uh, cries out in Revelation chapter 12, now has come the salvation. It means the fullness of salvation that was typified by the sprinkling of the, of the water and the ashes of the red heifer, full, uh, first for uh, being separated from God that allows us to come back into uh, uh, the presence of the Lord in the sanctuary of God. And then water baptism, which makes us complete and whole so that we can go further on in God to a whole new beginning. We will look at these types as we go. The Jews, just before uh, uh, the Feast of Atonement, uh, would come uh, before the priests, and they were and all over Jerusalem. Today, archaeologists have uncovered mikvahs or cutouts in the stone where it's just a, a rectangular cutout with stairways going down. It's room for one person to go in. And uh, there's usually a bowl cut out in the rock to the side with a little channel that then pours into the mikvah. And uh, then they usually line the mikvah with lime so it doesn't, the water doesn't leak out. They fill it up with water. And then as a person is coming into the water to be baptized, a, a, a servant pours water into the bowl, which then goes through the channel and then pours into the mikvah, making it what the Bible calls living water. This typifies the water of the Jordan River. And it typifies the water of the Red Sea, which was moving living water. And it typifies the water, which is a type of the Holy Spirit that is moving in our behalf. It's moving in our behalf and stimulating our spirits and stirring up conviction of sin. And the priest would invite the, the, the person to come into the waters and give their testimony. Who are you? What is your name? I am, a, I am so-and-so, Ben so-and-so. And, -so, and uh, why are you here? I am here to claim uh, uh, that, uh, death to self and to my old ways through the last year. And I am going to be a different man or a different woman in the year to come. And the priest would then say, then be baptized for the remission of your sins of this last year. And they would step down into the water and they would dunk themselves without the priest in the water. Usually, not always, but usually. Usually the mikvah was just big enough for one person. And they would dunk themselves, and if all of them went under the water, their hair and their clothing, nothing floated on top of the water, the priest would say, kosher. And they'd come out of the water glad and, uh, and rejoicing before God. Then they can go offer their sacrifice the next day at atonement and feel that my sacrifice will be accepted. And so then the priest would, uh, would invite the next person. And this was going on all the time. John the Baptist began uh, uh, this ministry in the Jordan River where the poor people went. Down in the muddy Jordan. But he would stand out in the water and invite the hundreds. He would preach repentance and invite them down. Then his uh, apostles were there to receive them. And they would give their testimony to their apostles. And then John would say, be baptized. And then hundreds at once could go down and be baptized and come back up. Jesus himself came to John for, for baptism. And the reason is, Jesus, uh, John said, but I have need of being baptized of you. Jesus said, we must do this to fulfill all righteousness. Righteousness is the, the word of God. It is the, the, the law and the prophets. That is, the, that is righteousness. In other words, Jesus was saying, I must fulfill the, the, the types also, even though I'm, I'm a man, even though I'm a, a perfect man and I have not sinned. I must fulfill the types because they, they portray going further on in God. And sure enough, when Jesus was water baptized, John knew this was truly the Messiah because John had a vision and saw the Spirit of God descend as a dove on Jesus. And Jesus became filled with the Spirit in a new way, in a new wave, in a greater depth because he fulfilled all righteousness. Does it matter to God? Does the types matter to God? Do the types matter to the Spirit? 
Absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. We've read before where uh, uh, Paul's saying that women need to have long hair. Why? Because of the, uh, the messengers, the spirits that are watching, both angels and demons. Why? Because the, the long hair or the short hair on a man, both things are true, is an instant quick sign to a demon spirit if you're open to the spirit of rebellion. Because God has put it in the nature of a woman to desire long hair. And they don't know why. They just do. Every culture is the same. Even the culture in African, uh, one African tribe, uh, the women cannot grow hair, men and women. They are bald from birth and they stay that way their whole lives. But the women still have the same instinct. This tribe, without, without knowing anything uh, of uh, Christianity or, or of Judaism, uh, these women get these elaborate scarves and they wear them on their heads as they're covering because of that instinct that is in all peoples, no matter what your culture is. And if we go against that God-given instinct, Paul tells us it's an instantaneous sign to angels and demons that we're open or we're not open to the spirit of rebellion, both men and women. So men wearing your hair long, that's a, that's a direct sign a spirit of rebellion is on you. And you're open to a spirit of rebellion. Christian men who, who think that they're cool, and especially in music ministers, but God forbid the pastors that think that they're cool because they have long hair and they're appealing to the young set, they're going directly against Scripture. And they are, it's a neon sign flashing to demon spirits. They're open to the spirit of rebellion. Come on in. And sure enough, the music... And the attitude that you see come forth is the spirit of rebellion. And uh, um, by the same token, uh, a woman who cuts her hair off, the same spirit of rebellion is there uh, and is waiting to manifest. In today's world, it's uh, the spirit of Laodicea. This water baptism is a beautiful type of dying to the old life and rising to walk in a new born-again life. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 through 11 for your notes. It is symbolized by going all the way under water, under the water as a body is put all the way underground. It is not symbolized by sprinkling. Sprinkling is only the first cleansing. The final cleansing is by full immersion. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. Rising up out of the water symbolizes uh, uh, both uh, the new birth, being born again, and the final resurrection from the dead. Praise God. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 11 for your notes. So when Jesus says you will become born again, he's talking about that you must go through the, the uh, full symbol of being dead to self all the way under the water and rising again, not just the sprinkling. So what do we see today? Well, we see some church groups that just sprinkle, and they call that baptism. Well, that means they're not born again, because you're not born by sprinkling. You're born by being birthed out of something, out of our mothers. That baptismal pool represents being birthed out of our mothers. You have to come fully out. You're not just, you're not laying on the ground and sprinkle and said, well, you were just born. No, you get born by being birthed out. You get resurrected by being resurrected out of the ground and being raised up. Most importantly, baptism is the answer of a good conscience towards God. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. It's the answer of a good conscience towards God. What does he mean by that? We'll explain that more on the very next 15-minute truth. Lord bless you.